Hi, we're so glad that you've joined us at Liberty Online. Uh, we may have to communicate digitally these days, but let me assure you that the Lord Jesus Christ is with you in person, right in your home, in front of your laptop, in front of your television or your cell phone. The Lord will meet you personally today. Let me share just a few thoughts about why we're doing what we're doing in these days. Um, when everybody is, some folks are experiencing this totally differently. Some folks are home and they're having a lot more screen time than they did. Some folks are working harder than ever in riskier and more difficult and challenging situations. So here's what we're doing. On Sunday, we have the online service. We include something for kids. I know a lot of churches aren't doing that, but that's part of who we are. We're a family church, and um, when we were growing up, we had uh, a children's message, and we weren't all uh, hustled off to children's church. So we're making that part of our our service. We're also um, trying to incorporate people to do prayer from home that can just pray in a cell phone. And so you see people that aren't just the pastoral staff and the, and the, the folks that are doing production. Uh, because as Camelia, I was talking to Camelia, she gave me a great quote. She says, I miss the people that make church church. It's not just the pastors that make church church, it's the relationships of people. And so we're going to try to highlight from time to time so you see somebody besides just the pastoral staff and the production crew. Um, also you'll notice that on, on weekdays we have a short devotional on Facebook. We have the great Bible studies on Wednesday night. We're starting a brand new one on followership this Wednesday night. So that's what we want you to do to have have frequent connections but short because basically we don't think you should lose your whole life to sitting behind a screen. Pray for your pastors. We're planning uh, and pastors and board as we plan on what to do when we reopen. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, right now in this service, would you give us a, such a powerful blessing, such a powerful word of God that speaks to right where we are, right what we're experiencing, not just the outer experience, but the inner experience, that you would give us direction for this day and for the future. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship together.
Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would be Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is the amazing grace. This is a failing love that you would take my place, that you would be. Yeah. 
liberty let's go to the lord in prayer this morning father god we just come before you right now in that powerful name of jesus the name that is above every name father we know right now that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think lord we know that with man things are impossible but with god all things are possible first of all father we just want to come and thank you for baby Alex, Lord, who has recuperated from his heart surgery, Father. Lord, you have brought him through, Lord, to the pleasure of his parents and his grandparents and all his aunts and uncles here at Liberty. Lord, you saw him through. You kept your hand upon him. You guided the doctors. and He has come out the other side, Lord, and he's doing well. Father, we thank you for that. Father, we just thank you right now that our friend Crystal has tested negative for COVID-19. Father, we thank you for your protection around her as she works in an environment, Lord, right now where that's going on quite often. Father, you have protected her and kept her. We just thank you for that, Father. And Lord, we know that you're able to make a way out of no way, Lord. So we would, we just want to lift up some, uh, from some friends and family to you right now, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, we just come to you right now for Sonny, Father, uh, Pastor Everett and Nancy's brother-in-law. Lord, as he's dealing with COVID-19 right now, Father, we know that you are Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals us. Father, you are greater than COVID-19, and we ask you right now to touch him in the name of Jesus. Heal him and raise him up from off of his sickbed. Father, Lord, we just pray that you would touch him and speed his recovery right now in the name of Jesus. Do a work in his life, Father, we pray right now in Jesus' name. Father, we just pray right now. For all our hospitals and our nursing homes, Father, Lord, you see what's going on, Lord. We pray that they will not be overwhelmed. Give the doctors and nurses courage. Give them guidance. Father, we just pray right now in the name of Jesus that you'll protect them as they work on the front lines. Father, we lift up before you right now, Morton Hospital and Life Care and Mary and Manor. Lord, we just ask you right now, Jesus, to touch every single person that is in those places Father, let your hand be upon them. Let the healing power of the blood of Jesus just flow through those places right now, O oh God, we pray. Father, we pray, Lord, for our many family and friends who have lost loved ones at this time. Father, we just pray that the peace of God that passes all understanding will just touch them right now. Let your love and your comfort of your Holy Spirit just be upon them, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. We don't understand why, but Lord, you saw fit to take our loved ones and, and you saw fit to take those people home. So Father, we ask you right now that you will just fill that hole that's been left behind with your grace and your peace and your presence. Father, we just pray right now for Millie's father, Lord, who is in a who is going through sickness and is in critical condition right now. Father, we ask you to touch him. Father, lay a hand upon him. Lord, minister unto him. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. We pray that your will would be done in his life. Father, we pray that you would just have your way. Father, if it be your will to call him home, Father, that you would do that. But if it's your will that he should still be here, Father, raise him up, we pray quickly in the name of Jesus. Lay your hand upon him, Father. Let your comfort and peace surround him, we pray right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just pray right now for our liberty, friends and family. Lord, who are right now listening to me pray. Father, Lord, I ask you right now that you would touch them, give them peace and comfort during this time. 
Father, Lord, it's so easy to get stirred, crazy. Lord, it's easy to get fearful. But, Father, I pray that our eyes will be upon you and that you will be our peace and you will be our hope and you will be our beacon and our guide. Father, Lord, just touch us and speak to us and keep us close to Jesus. Father, keep us at the foot of the cross, I pray in Jesus' name. Father, we pray for Sabrina, whose baby is due in two weeks. Lord, in the midst of all the chaos, in the midst of all that's going on, you are bringing forth new life. And Father, Lord, I ask you right now to protect her and that little one that is inside of her. Father, keep them, preserve them. Father, I pray, Lord, for a, a smooth delivery that your hand will be upon them. And Father, that this new little one will be with us soon to celebrate in you, O oh God. Father, I just pray right now that you just touch each and every one. And let your love flow one from another, I pray. Have your way, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Don't forget, as you're watching Kids at Liberty, to look for Red the Lobster. And when you spot where he is, you can text to 617-997-8070. That's 617-997-8070. Or email to kidsatliberty at gmail.com. And let me know where you spotted Red. And you'll get lots of veggie bucks. Hi, welcome today. I'm Pastor Beth, and I'm bringing a little bit of an object lesson to you. And again, this might be geared for the kids, but I have yet to meet very many humans who do not enjoy an ice cream sundae. I actually met one years ago, true story, on a ladies' retreat who claimed that she wasn't interested in, uh, you know, candy or sweets or anything that was bad for her until it was time for the ice cream sundae that happened every weekend and suddenly we turned around and look who had a bowl of ice cream in front of her. So I'm pretty sure ice cream sundaes are one of those things that hardly anyone can walk away from. So I'm going to talk to you today about a few simple things and just to put yourself um, in a different mindset. So here I have a really big bowl of ice cream and you're going to just work with me here and assume that you are the ice cream. The ice cream represents you. Now hopefully, even during these times, you're not eating bowls of ice cream like this because otherwise you're not gonna fit anything including your pajamas when this is over. But we're gonna assume that you are like this bowl of ice cream, which is amazing. And I'm looking at this and normally my favorite is cherry vanilla, but this is pretty close because it's vanilla with strands of strawberry in it. Yum, okay, so you and the ice cream. And then we get some sprinkles put on it. Now you could put, uh, I know up here you guys call them jimmies, um, but I'm going to put a bunch of sprinkles on here and you can see from this bowl that my sprinkles are all multicolored. Beautiful different colors and these represent all of the different ways God has made you different. You have different talents and abilities and things that make you you. Your bowl of ice cream is going to look different than anyone else's. And then I'm going to put some bananas in here. We're going to assume that this is going to be like a big banana split Sunday thing-ish. And so we stick those in there. And I knew I was going to need a napkin because that was going to be a little bit slimy. And those bananas represent the fruit of the spirit. We're going to come back to that in just a minute. So we've got our bananas in there. And then we're going to put some whipped cream on there. And, and the whipped cream doesn't actually represent anything. It's just you cannot have an ice cream sundae without whipped cream. I'm sure we could make it mean something, but right now it just tastes good. And you should actually taste good to the world. You should come across as something that is sweet and kind. And see, there we go. We made a connection with our can of whipped cream. And at the end, we're going to put these cherries on them now. Some people just put one on. And what fun is that? See, when I was a kid, I could just eat a whole, my mother would have to hide them because I could just sit there, open up a jar of maraschino cherries and go to town. But these cherries right here represent you and the hair on your head, the numbers of the hairs on your head are unique. Everything about you is unique. And so we have this beautiful bowl of ice cream here. The ice cream is you. We have the fruit of the spirit, the different ways that you are different in those sprinkles from everyone else. 
But we're going to focus on that fruit of the Spirit for just a minute. I'm going to look there, and you know that in the book of Galatians, that's where you find that fruit of the Spirit. So we're just going to look there for a minute. We're going to look away from the ice cream sundae for a moment. And it says in the book of Galatians, But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, oh, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And I love the ending part of that. It says, Against such things there is no law. You're never going to find it against the law to be patient, to be loving, to be thankful, all of those things together. And so I really would encourage you as you're thinking, boy, mom, I'd really love an ice cream sundae about right now. I would encourage you to take your Bibles out, read those fruit of the Spirit, and then think about yourself and some of the gifts and talents that God has given you. And I think that's a really great thing to be thinking about in these times when we maybe have a little bit more time on our hands and when you've turned off your screens for a while and think all these ways, like these sprinkles in this bowl, that God has made me different and I have all of these different talents and that God has made me unique and there's specific hairs on my head, and there are things that just make me different, and that, those things that make you unique are that cherry on the top of your sundae. It puts the whole picture together, and then you have those bananas there that are the fruit of the Spirit. And one thing to remember, and I didn't learn this for a long time, or I didn't realize it, that God doesn't say you have to work on one or two of those fruit of the Spirit. It's like, well, if you get five out of nine of them, you're good. No the fruit of the Spirit kind of come together as a group. So while you're looking at it, you could say, I'm all right at loving people. I can be pretty joyful. I can be thankful, but I'm pretty low on the patience scale. But I'm all right, because I got the other three going on. No, you and your bowl of ice cream here, your wonderful, amazing self, need to work on all of those together. But also think about those talents that God has given you, because they're going to go together and they're going to help each other. So just encourage you today, Two things, maybe three, uh, go open your Bible, read those. There are some really fun YouTube songs that go along with it as well, just saying. And think about what God's given you as good things that you know how to do. And then find some ice cream. You can have a whole meditation and prayer time over your bowl of ice cream. So go read those, enjoy your Sunday, and have a great day. secret next week it's mother's day next week is, how did that happen we thought we might be together but we're not going to be together but that doesn't mean we're going to forget about our moms if you will email a picture of your mama to us at lcctaunton at gmail.com we're going to do something special with it now if you can't find a picture laying around just grab a phone. Somebody will help you. I'm sure you know how to do it anyway. And go get a picture of your mom to email it to lcctaunton at gmail.com and we'll use it, but shh. Don't tell don't anybody. Body. It's a secret. We do thank you for joining us today at Liberty Christian Center. We thank you that you joined us during our time of worship. And the Bible does tell us to lift our voices to him to sing a new song and to be joyful. So we, we hope that the Lord has touched your heart already today and brought a joyful noise to your heart and to your lips. And so we're going to come into the time of the service right now that's another time of worship that the Lord has asked us to bring our tithes and our offerings. And we thank you so much, LCC community, for the way that you have continued to support God's work here in Taunton and around the world in our missions giving. We know that on the screen below here, you'll be able to see the different places where you can give online, uh, the address for the church where you can mail that check-in. And we thank you for the way that you have been faithful with what God has given you. And we know that we continue to do the work of the Lord right now. We continue to plan to do the work of the Lord um, in the coming months, in the future, in all the ways that God has set out. And I think one of the things I'm the most encouraged by is knowing that um, God is the God of right now and he is the God of the future and he sees all those opportunities that we're going to have. And we're so glad you're a part of the church and you'll be a part of those opportunities. So I encourage you just to bow your heads with me 
and we're going to pray right before we take the offering. God, we thank you so much that you are the God of yesterday and today and forever. Lord, we know that our hope is built in you. It is not built on the things of this world. And so we do bring a joyful noise to you this morning, and we bring our tithes and offerings, Lord, like that little boy who brought his lunch to you all those years ago and just gave it to you to do with it what you would. And so we bring our offerings to you today and ask you, Lord, that you will multiply them, that you will use them for those in need, God, and that you will do with them what you will. And we thank you for today, and we thank you for tomorrow, and we thank you for that our hope is built in you. We thank you for these things, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood in righteousness. I did not trust the sweetest ring, but holy trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness.
weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm he is born Lord of all Jesus we worship you Hallelujah So we are in our third in the series of songs from a cave. These are psalms that David wrote while he was in troubled times. Would you turn with me to Psalm 54? Turn with me to Psalm 54. I'll give you a moment and meet you there. This is a time in his life when he, he condenses three stories from 1 Samuel 22 to 26. He condenses three stories of when the Ziphites, that's the folks from the region that he's hiding out in, uh, they keep being tattletales and telling Saul where he is. Uh, I'm sure some money changed hands there. So I hope you're there. Psalm 54, let's read it together. But the beginning is very important here. Uh, there's some instructions because David has an idea of what he wants this to be as he writes about this time in his life. He says it's for a choir director. That means he wants this to be sung uh, in worship. This is meant to be a worship song, so it's meant to be for everyone. So he doesn't give a lot of details. He just kind of sets the scene. A psalm of David regarding the time the Ziphites came and said to Saul, we know where David is hiding to be accompanied by stringed instruments. Well, I'm all for that. So let's read it together. Come with great power, O God, and rescue me. Defend me with your might. Listen to my prayer, O God. Pay attention to my plea, for strangers are attacking me. Violent people are trying to kill me. They care nothing for God. And then there's a word, silla, or you might have interlude. That's where we put the guitar solo, right, Paul? But God is my helper, verse 4 says. But God is my helper. The Lord keeps me alive. May the evil plans of my enemies be turned against them. Do as you promised and put an end to them. I will sacrifice a voluntary offering to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. For you have rescued me from my troubles and helped me triumph over my enemies. This is a psalm that he writes in the face of fear to incorporate all these things of faith and, and feelings into one. And let me give you some reasons why he wrote this psalm. First of all, you know, he, I'm going to tell you the story a little bit later, but he is surrounded. Three times he's surrounded by Saul's crack troops. Three times he's, he escapes. Three times these guys rat him out. He has reason to sing. When, when you've been rescued by God, you have reason to sing. So here's some reasons for David to write this song, for him to sing this song. Firstly, to simply worship the Lord. If you don't get anything out of this entire series, get this one thing. There is power in worship. There is power in worshiping the Lord. During this coronavirus, during the shutdowns and homeschooling the kids and worrying about the most vulnerable family members and worrying about the bills if you're not working and worrying about your health if you are, there is power in worshiping the Lord. There is comfort in going into the presence of God. Uh, many times we do that with not with prayer, but we also do it with some kind of artistic expression, usually music. Uh, there is power and comfort and healing in worshiping the Lord. There is strength. There is joy in worshiping God. In the presence of the Lord, when you worship him, if you don't take anything else out, learn this from David. Second thing is he wants to remember this time in his life. Uh, you know, the words of the Holocaust, they always say, the Jewish people would say, never forget, but people are forgetting. Columbine, well, that goes by, who remembers it? 9-11, we look back to remember these things. How many of you even, after 9-11, how many of you even remembered that there was a World Trade Center bombing in 1993? Oh, you forgot about that one, didn't you? Well, I was there shortly after that one. That, that one's harder for me to forget. And, uh, the 1968 to 69 Hong Kong flu pandemic. I, I have run into two people that remember this. I 
remember it. I got sick. I got better. I was reading about this. I was just a little kid reading about this all over the world. A million people died. You don't even remember, do you? You remember that Janis Joplin o overdosed. You remember that Bobby Kennedy got shot in those years. But you don't even remember that a million people died. There's something wrong about that. David is going through this difficult time and he wants to remember it. He wants it written down and he wants people to be able to profit from the ideas, the things that he's learned here. And he writes this for an artistic expression of both his faith, his feelings, and then he wants, he calls it a masculine. That's an instructional psalm. That means the, he's trying to share his experiences with other people. Now, this is very tied to something that is, is history. So let Take a walk with me and let's learn, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. So I've told you the psalm, shared the psalm with you. Now I'm going to share the backstory. The backstory is when David's hiding in the hill country and it's found in, in 1 Samuel chapter 22, 23, 24. But I'm going to just give you the good parts here. David and his men had moved to the wilderness of Maon in the... Arab Valley south of Jeshimon. When David heard that Saul and his men were searching for him, he went even further into the wilderness to the great rock and he remained there in the wilderness of Maon, but Saul kept after him in the wilderness. And then they call that big rock, they call it the rock of escape. Now, it doesn't take long for David, the men of Ziph to betray him yet again and they tell Saul where he is. So, David is going up, well, I don't have his style of mountains, but I've got this mountain behind my farmhouse. So walk with me for a little bit, and um, I'll show you why he would want to be hiding up so high. All right. Are you coming? So... 1 Samuel chapter 24 starts out like this. After Saul returned from fight, fighting the Philistines, he got called away from the rock the last time to go fight the Philistines. That's the end of chapter 23. Now in chapter 24, he gathers 3,000 of his elite troops and goes after David in the rocks where the wild goats hang out. Now there's a lot of reasons that David wants to be up high with the rocks. Uh, obviously there's a lot of hiding places. Uh, it's up high, it makes your enemy have to come uphill, which tires them out. It also, um, it allows them to see and maybe escape off a different direction uh, when you see people coming after you. But da this time, David has no choice but to retreat. He's got 3,000 men after him. They're basically surrounded. They come up the mountain and they have no choice. He's got 600 of his scoundrels that he's gathered and they have no choice but to retreat into a cave. This is kind of a funny story, isn't it? Here David has 600 of the dregs of society and they're surrounded by 3,000 of Saul's crack elite troops with all, you know, so much better equipment than David has been able to accumulate and uh, Saul, King Saul, has to answer the call of nature and apparently it's not just one of those quick let's go behind a tree thing, it's uh, you know get a magazine and the cell phone and you're gonna be a while type of uh, session and while he, he partially disrobes, takes his robe off and David's men do something that uh, honestly a lot of us Christians would do if we were in this kind of situation, they basically say, you know what, this is, this is a sign from God. God has delivered your enemy into your hands. There is a really interesting thing here. And that is that David has a clarity that Saul does not about who his enemy is. You see, to Saul, David was just as much his enemy as the Philistines were. But to David, even though Saul is trying to kill him, the Philistines are the enemy, Saul is, he's still my king. Does that sting at all? It, it probably should for a lot of us. 
I, I want you to, I'm just going to let that there. This is scripture. I'm going to let you apply that to our situation. Okay, so here he is. Saul's answering the uh, a call of nature, and David is being encouraged by his men to kill him. This is your chance. Look, you kill him, and we're trapped in this cave, but there's a great thing about being in a cave. We only, we only have to fight people on one front. We come out, if Saul's gone, the army will scatter, they'll fight us hard for a little while, but they're gonna be fighting uphill and at the mouth of the cave, we don't have to watch anybody at our backs. We can do this. Let's take him out, take him out now. And David says, no, but I've had it with this guy. I'm gonna let him know that he was in my hand. So he sneaks up and cuts off a piece of his robe. And then, unable to not grandstand a little bit, I mean, look, you gotta, you gotta give the guy a break here, right? He comes out and he says, hey, King Saul, my lord the king, why do you constantly listen to people that say, I wanna kill you, that I want your throne? I had the opportunity to kill you right now, and my men were telling me that's what I should do, but I won't do it because you're the Lord's anointed. And you know, and, and he says, you know, may the Lord decide between us who is right. There is a, Saul at this point, he becomes humbled and he says, you know what, you're a better man. Honestly, the scripture says, he says that you're a better man than I am. I, I wouldn't have done that. I should go and, and let you in peace and I'm, I'm going to go and leave you alone and I'm not going to, and of course it doesn't last long, but for a while Saul is humbled. He realizes that David had him. Uh, back when I was in screenwriting courses, they used to say about good people will surprise you and do bad things and bad people can surprise you and do good things but eventually character will tell unless there is an inner change, unless you, so when you're writing a screenplay or you're writing a novel, or a, a, unless you show progress that somebody is changing from the inside out, yes, pe bad people can surprise you and do gracious things and good people can surprise you and do very selfish things, but eventually character will tell unless it has been built somewhere evil people are still evil and and good people will still they'll come right at some point and <clears throat> that's basically what David says and this is what we see in the life of Saul we see a man that started out godly we see a man that started out <coughs> he was the Lord's anointed and although God took his favor, removed his favor because of his disobedience and his constant, he made everything about himself, uh, David refuses to raise his hand against the Lord's anointed. He says, that's, that's not my job. Even though he is also the Lord's anointed, he says, that's not my job. I'm, that's not my place. I won't be a politician just like everybody else. I won't come into the throne by being having a coup d'etat like everybody else does. I'm not going to be like that. I'm going to be different. And that is a tremendous difference. This is a change. This is a, a test for David's integrity. It's a test also of his faith. Because remember, he's been waiting since he was a boy. He was anointed as king by, by the prophet Samuel as a boy. So it, it, to his men, it looks like he's been handed the throne on a silver platter. But he says, no, that's not the way I'm going to take it. It was the Lord that anointed me as a shepherd boy. It will be the Lord <coughs> that will, will place me there. And I won't do it by subterfuge. I won't do it by military conquest. I won't do it by assassinating the king. How about you? Do we justify sometimes bad behavior because of the circumstances seem favorable? Whoa, it's a sign from God. I should disobey his word because the circumstances look like he set this up for me. How can it be wrong when it feels so right? How many affairs have been justified by people that say things like that? Well, I believe that God placed this person in my life. Well, 
you're already married. Sorry. <laughs> um, you know, how many th times do we justify doing the wrong thing? We use spiritual language to justify doing the wrong thing, things that are expressly against his, God's will because we're tr looking for signs in the circumstances when God has already ex given us his express will. This is a test of David. It's a test of his integrity. It's a test of where his faith will really lie. If he really believes that God, the promise of God, even though he doesn't see how it could possibly happen, he's got 600 men. Saul has 3,000, <coughs> and those are just his elite troops. He's got thousands more. How can a man with 600 dregs of society in a cave hiding out in a cave without having a coup, how can he ever come into the throne? How can this thing that God has promised him ever be true? But we come back to this psalm now. That's the, this is the backstory of the psalm. Let's go now back to the psalm and look at, because when you get to a psalm, the psalm is the backstories and all the feelings that David has when he's hiding out, when he's on the run, when he's been betrayed by his king, when he's been betrayed by people, the Ziphites, that he thought were friends, when he's had so many things, we see what his feelings are about. Because that's what songs are. Songs are, are our emotions and our, our thoughts put to music and so that they have greater expression than just reading them. We know these these psalms, we know them as scripture, but the Jews knew them as songs that, and you know how it is, you, you, you hear a teaching, it's great, but it, it, it'll, it'll evaporate, but if you hear it in a song, you go, wow, I feel like that. That's what a pop song does. It takes, it's not necessarily great music, it's just a feeling that you can identify with and you listen to it and it's set to music and those emotions resonate with with the artistic expression and you go I feel like that so let's go back to the psalm and look at the feelings that express this man running away from his enemy surrounded hiding in caves hiding out in the rocks surrounded and all of a sudden he has the possibility to take this by force but he doesn't do it Let's see what he says about that. In 1 Samuel 26, guess what? It's deja vu all over again. It's the same pattern as chapter 24. The Ziphites, once again, they spill the beans about David's location to Saul. This is the third time they've done it. So David, they're not your friends. Saul, this time, doesn't quite surround him. He's still got 3,000 troops, but he doesn't quite surround him. David and his friend Abishai, uh, look down the mountain, see them camped out. Everybody's asleep. They sneak down into the camp. David grabs the jug of water from Saul's tent and his spear that's by his head. They sneak back up the mountain, call out, wake up the whole camp and say, hey, Abner, you're supposed to be the king's bodyguard. You didn't do a very good job. I, here's his water bottle. Here's his spear. Will you guys please knock it off? Why will you keep chasing me and act like I'm your enemy when I've had two chances to kill you and I didn't do it? So how am I your enemy? Will you please chill out? That's Greg's version, by the way. Um, and once again, Saul gets all su mushy and pseudo-spiritual. It doesn't mean anything. You know, he's still who he is. And uh, that's, that's the end of this story. But David takes all these experiences of be the emotions of being betrayed by Saul, by the Ziphites, the constant threat that he's under, the evil plans. I mean, it wears on him. And the emotions, he puts that all in this psalm and in these others. And he, what does he do with it? He cries out to God. That's what he tells us in verses 1 and 2. He cries out to God. And then in verse 4, he declares that God is his helper, that God alone is his protector. Hey, he's got these 600 rough dudes that he's gathered with him. He's not depending on them. Does he depend on them? Sure, of course he does. But that is not what he's saying in this psalm. He says, God, you alone are my protector. You might use some of these guys around me, but truthfully, you are my protector. Have you decided that?
Then he also decides to praise God and honor God first and be willing to sacrifice to him voluntarily. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But he speaks of his deliverance as past tense. Let's look at this Psalm 54 and the backstory together and draw a couple of things that I want you to see is that he has these two public moments of decision when he has Saul at his mercy. They come out of many private moments of decision that he puts God first. Many private moments in this cave, many private moments on that mountain, many private mo moments that he decided to put God first before he could be in a cave with Saul at his mercy, in a camp with Saul at his mercy and not take his life. He has respect for God's leaders at, that, that even though this man is no longer, King Saul is no longer following God, he was at one point God's anointed. And yes, honestly, would the country be better off without, out of him? Of course it would. Would it be better off when King, David is king? Oh yeah! But David won't do it by his hand. Folks, here's what I want you to see is that trust in God Genuine trust in God, really pure heart religion, refuses to short circuit the plan of God by disobeying the word of God. So many times we justify and we have people like David's friends and they weren't trying to be bad friends. They weren't trying to be sinful. But what they were doing is encouraging to, to get God's plan by, by breaking the word of God. And folks, you can talk yourself into this and you'll have friends that say, oh yes, God is very, very definitely in it. But folks, I want to tell you that God will not work his plan by asking you to break his word. Look at this psalm again, verse 4. But God is my helper. He keeps me alive. May you... May the evil plans of my enemy be turned against them. Do as you promised and put an end to them. And then he says, I will sacrifice a voluntary offering to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. You've rescued me. I will sacrifice a voluntary offering. Let's, let's get practical and apply this to our lives. Do you call to God when you're in trouble? Is this a time that you're having some troubles? Look, folks, if you look inside, you'll only bring yourself to discouragement. If you look around you, you'll only bring yourself disappointment. But if you look up to God, God will bring you deliverance. Psalm 50 says, call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you. Psalm 20 says this, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Proverbs 18 10 says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are saved. This is the point he's saying is, I've got these men in a cave telling me that I'm, I should put an end to Saul's life. I've got the, my buddy Abishai telling me, put an end to Saul's life, but I won't do it because I refuse to do God's will by a sinful way. It is amazing this, this, that this whole concept of sacrifice has gotten lost in the gospel as we have let the me generation kind of take this thing over and make it the gospel something that is no longer transformational. That there's the idea of sacrifice is no longer first and foremost. But folks, the idea of sacrifice has always been at the heart of God's true people, true friends of God. Remember Moses? who chose to suffer in the wilderness with God's people rather than enjoy the pleasures of being in the Pharaoh's palace and being part of the entourage. Remember that Moses, at one point, God is, says, i am had it with the children of Israel. Moses, stand back, you and your family, I'm going to wipe away at, at these Israelites. And God said, Moses says, no, Lord, don't do that. If you're going to do that, take me too. He's so committed to these people, he's willing to sacrifice himself. Remember the, the three Hebrew children thrown into the fire. They're, they say, we don't know if God is going to rescue us, but we won't bow down to your idol, O king. The sacrifice has always been part, but the, we've made the gospel all about this thing like it's some... It's all about us. It's not all about us. It's all about God. Even the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, as he's in Gethsemane, he prayed, 
Father, not my will, but thine be done. And by doing the will of the Father, he brought salvation to you, to me, and to all who call upon the name of the Lord. This is the real gospel. Is when we're not willing to break the word of God to do the will of God. When we're willing to put aside our priorities, our selfish needs, our, our wants, our desires. There's an incredible story of the power of sacrifice that I remember from the 80s told by President Reagan. And I had to look this up to remember it fully. It was the story of a Greek monk named Telemachus in the about 391 AD, the latter part of the Roman Empire. He was so upset what he saw the popularity of the gladiatorial games. This was the monk who ended the gladiatorial blood sports. You see, people were fascinated by the sight of blood and gore on the arena floor, and the bishops and priests would criticize this, but nobody was willing to do anything. Worst of all, there's the fact that most of the gladiators that fought in the arena, they weren't there voluntarily. They were slaves, or they were political prisoners, or the dregs of society that were forced to train and fight to the death for the sheer blood sport entertainment of the masses, and many of whom were supposed to be Christians. Emperor Honorius was himself a well-known Christian, and yet he sponsored the games and many of his fellow Christians sat in prominent seats in the arena. Telemachus wondered if there could be anything further from the spirit of Christ than than this total disregard for human life that he saw and decency that he saw on the arena floor as these men battled to the death, battled with wild lions and tigers and bulls and were just slaughtered. It was, it was horrible to him. And so he felt that something ought to be done besides speaking out against it. So he traveled to the city of Rome from his rural village and he gets there and people are crazy with excitement. To the Colosseum they're crying, the games are about to begin. So Ptolemaeus follows the crowd and he's seated among all the other people when the gladiators came out to the center of the arena and everybody's tense and excited and watching uh, as these two men faced each other. They drew their swords and the fight was about to be on and it was expected within a few minutes one of them would be dead on the arena floor. But at that very moment, Telemachus, this humble monk <coughs> from a rural village, took action. He went down, uh, left his seat, went down to the arena floor, raised high the cross of Christ, and shouted, threw himself into a position between the two gladiators and shouted, in the name of our master, the Lord Jesus Christ, stop fighting. And an amazing thing happened. The gladiators put away their swords and stopped fighting. and the crowd went wild. He had robbed them of their afternoon's entertainment. And if they couldn't have blood one way, they'd have another. And so the, the mob poured out of the stands and onto the arena floor and picked up every stone they could find and stoned him, pulled stones from the stonework that makes up the Colosseum. Anything that was loose, they threw it at him and battered this old Greek monk until there was no life left in his battered body. And when it stopped moving and the last stones were thrown, a hush fell over that arena. They write that a hush fell over it and the emperor himself, Emperor Honorius, rose and left the Colosseum. And one by one, the officials got up pulled their robes around them, and left, ashamed by the sacrifice of this old man to stop, stop something that was shameful already. And the people followed him, and the games were over. And folks, they really were over because within a few months, the Emperor Honorius issued an edict that in the in the Roman Empire, there would be no more gladiatorial blood sport games. That this 
was not Christian. <sighs> All because one individual filled with so much love for Christ that he was willing to sacrifice his very own life to stand, to do God's will, God's way. No matter what it cost him. Folks, pri private victories will always precede the public successes in the kingdom of God. I don't know what challenges you may be going through right now, but I will tell you this. You can call on God and tell him how it is in your life. Tell him, just like David, what you're feeling, what's going on around you, and call out to him. Decide that you're going to trust in him, that he alone is your protector and your rescuer, and that you are willing to sacrifice your will, your way, to do God's will, God's way, and see God do something amazing in your family, with the people now that you have such such limited access to, and yet the, the, the connection that you have is so much more important and more powerful than ever it was, that you'd be willing to sacrifice your way to do God's will, and that you would praise him every day anyway, regardless of what's going on. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are moved and we are challenged by this this story. And Lord, we put aside our complaints. They seem to pale by comparison. And we say, Lord, we want to be people that are willing to lay down our lives, lay down our personal priorities and all the things that we think are important to be the people that bring your love and bring life change to those around us. Lord, we have limited connection right now. So, Help us make it count. In the name of Jesus, would you direct our thoughts, our conversation this week to do something glorious in your kingdom, that we would decide to call on you, to trust you, to put you first, and to praise you, to have that power of the Holy Spirit that transforms us from the inside out every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey folks, thanks for joining us. We'll see you on Wednesday. We have a brand new study. We'll see you on the internet. God love you. We look forward to the day when we're together for real.